Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Megan Macklin, and I serve as a program manager in the UC Davis Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, where I manage the Campus Community Book Project. Thank you for joining today's event. To begin, a couple of housekeeping items for our virtual time together. Today's event is being recorded, and the recording will be made available on the Book Project website. During the presentation, all participants will be muted in order to limit disruptions. We do encourage you though to turn on your video. It's great, especially for our presenter to see faces. For security purposes, we've disabled the option for participants to rename themselves. However, if you want to rename yourself, please send a chat to me, Megan Macklin, or my colleague, Sunny DeSange, and we'd be happy to rename you. During today's workshop, our presenter will take and also ask questions of our group. You are invited to pose your questions and responses in the chat. During the question and answer portion and during the presentation, you also can use the raise hand feature, which you can find at the bottom of the participant menu. I'll then call on you and invite you to unmute yourself to ask your question or to provide your response. The UC Davis Campus Community Book Project promotes dialogue and builds community by encouraging diverse members of the campus and surrounding communities to read the same book and attend related events. The Book Project, a signature initiative out of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion since 2002, advances the mission to improve both the campus climate and community relations, to foster diversity, and to promote equity and inclusiveness. Currently in its 19th year, the Book Project in 2020-2021 focuses on the theme of mental health and features graphic memoir Marbles, Mania Depression, Michelangelo and Me by Ellen Forney. Our theme and selection are supported by a year-long program of lectures, workshops, book discussions, film screenings, exhibits, performances, and more, which this year will take place virtually. Our program culminates when author Ellen Forney joins us on Monday, March 1st at 4 p.m. for a virtual lecture and live Q&A. With support from the UC Davis Office of the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Robert and Margaret Mondavi Center for the Performing Arts, and Downey Brand, we are pleased to offer this event free of charge. For more information about Ellen Forney's talk and about the Book Project program, visit our website where you can find up-to-date information, registration links, and other information. We also welcome your involvement, students, staff, faculty, and community members in selecting the book project featured title and in planning our annual program. If you're interested in getting more involved with the book project, please send us an email or refer to the book project website for more information. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Tracy Thomas, who will lead us in a workshop on burnout prevention. Tracy is a California licensed marriage and family therapist working as a community counselor for student health and counseling services at UC Davis. Tracy earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Communication Studies from UCLA and her Master of Arts degree from Bramman University. Through her work in a nonprofit community health centers throughout the Sacramento area, she has compassionately provided mental health services to culturally and socioeconomically diverse populations from marginalized, underrepresented, and underserved communities, including Native American and Indigenous populations. Tracy has specialized interests, training, and experience in treating symptoms of PTSD and trauma, including intergenerational trauma experienced by oppressed people. She uses eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR, as a primary tool to help clients heal from traumatic experiences. Additionally, through her work experience in a partial hospitalization program, she has specialized training in treating eating disorders and other co-occurring mental illnesses using acceptance and commitment therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy. Her theoretical orientation is primarily humanistic. Tracy's personal philosophy in counseling is rooted in the belief that regardless of the complex emotional challenges that one might be facing, each person can experience emotional freedom and reach his or her maximum potential in life. She enjoys helping students embrace their intersecting identities into a healthy, holistic, and integrated self sense of self. Tracy celebrates her multicultural ethnicity, including honoring and giving back to her Choctaw identity. Tracy, we're thrilled to have you join us this evening, and please take it away. All right. Thank you all. It's wonderful to have this opportunity. A uh, huge audience. Sounds like a lot of people are interested in this subject, especially nowadays during a pandemic. There's so much stress and overwhelm going on. And, and I think there's a little bit of, um, people always tend to think of burnout as, you know, I'm working too many hours. I'm stressed out. It is a lot of that but it's so much more. So I, I wanna share this workshop with you and have it be as inter, interactive as possible. So I wanna hear from you and learn from you and I'd love for you to participate. If you wouldn't mind, I, you're gonna need a piece of paper and pen 
And I saw some lovely people who, who gave me a visual reminder to drink some water, uh, get your favorite tea, get something that helps to soothe you because talking about burnout can also cause some distress. And uh, this is a harder one for me to do. I've done this presentation uh, many times. However, I have not felt as much burnout in myself while doing it. <laughs> so I am right there with you. Um, one of the things that made me really interested in doing this presentation, a lot of you are coming from UC Davis Health and Sacramento campus. And when I went to go get my uh, vaccination, you know, all of the things that I was thinking about in terms of helping my clients and doing the work that I so love on the way there, you, you know, on that, I can't remember what boulevard it is on the way to the campus, but to the hospital, you see a sea of homeless people on the side of the road. And I was thinking to myself, my goodness, if I had to, you know, watch that and see that every day on my way to work, feeling depleted or overwhelmed by trying to help people all day long, that's got to add to your, your burnout. So please, um, I'm going to be as vulnerable with you as you will with me. I think that makes for the best workshops because I'm not here to teach you or lecture you. You've seen a lot of information about stress reduction and burnout. This isn't one of those workshops. This is about you looking in the mirror and getting real and having a real dialogue with each other and me about what's happening internally and how you can help yourselves to feel a little better and less burnt out in the end. So I invite you to share and be vulnerable and to really, really think about some things that you can do uh, to reduce this, the level of burnout that you might be experiencing. So I'll share my screen now and we'll get started. All right. Megan, can everybody see my screen? Looks good, Tracy. All right, sounds good. All right. We're gonna talk about burnout. Some of the things that we're gonna go over today are understanding the stages of burnout and recognizing if you're experiencing it now. Learning how to practice values-based self-care and determine the non-negotiables in your well-being, the things where you're gonna say absolutely no to, to preserve your health and being very, very careful of what you say yes to. Develop a willingness to focus on your highest priorities your values, the things that matter to you the most, and evaluate if your yes aligns with your values and personal capacity and how to practice your no with the least amount of guilt as possible. Sound good? Burnout, what is it? Exhaustion, a physical or emotional strength or motivation, usually as a result of prolonged stress and frustration. The frustration piece we're going to talk about as well, because it's not just a stressful job and long hours, it's more than that. Burnout occurs when passionate, committed people such as yourselves become deeply disillusioned with a job or career from which they have previously derived much of their identity and meaning. It comes as things that inspire passion and enthusiasm are stripped away and tedious or unpleasant things crowd in. All of us came into our careers, you know, with thoughts of what it is that we wanted to do and how we want to help people. And we're passionate about that work. And a lot of things get in the way of helping us to feel really good about what we do and lay our head down at night and feel like we are going to have the most restful and restorative sleep possible. So let's talk about the curve, how this happens. We start out with really excessive high, high expectations, right? I'm working for this organization. We're going to cure people. We're going to help people. We're going to solve problems. We're going to, you know, change the world. And then you're, you're working hard, 12, how many hour days, doing everything you can. And sometimes there's very little reward, right? Perhaps you're not being recognized for your efforts. Perhaps 
that there is no end to the work. As many people as you help, there's just a stream more people coming in. And for some reason, the values that you have and the things that you really want to do, you can't seem to get, get through, right? <laughs> they can't seem to get done. It doesn't go anywhere. So very slow progress. No end in sight to the work that, that is being given to you. And then rage towards others starts to come in because we started out feeling so great and so wonderful. And then now we're like, wow, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> That's where the mental and physical exhaustion starts to come in. And then descending into cynicism, feelings of despair and hopelessness, loss of belief in any future, and then total and complete collapse. This sad part here that many people unfortunately get to, and we're gonna talk about how to prevent that, right? But this part right here, sometimes it takes people two years of comprehensive therapy and comprehensive total self-care to rebuild themselves back up so that they're ready to, to be fully functional again. So it's really important to start recognizing and, and stepping in as soon as possible. So I know this is a big slide. I'm not going to read all of it, but let's, let's have some real talk right? Let's have some real talk today about burnout. In what ways, and you can participate in the chat, are you burning yourself out? Number one is, you know, basic self-care. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about, you know, how much sleep you're getting, right? When I first uh, started doing this presentation, you know, I would ask people, tell me exactly how much sleep do you really need if you're looking in the mirror and being honest? And how much sleep are you really getting? And you get it all over the mark, right? Some people are sleeping actually more than they need to, but some people aren't, aren't even hitting the mark at all. Reliance on substances, no balance. There's no time for fun or leisure or hobbies. And in your workplace, you may be unwilling to ask for support and help. This, this imposter syndrome that you should be a super person and be able to do it all. And what if they don't think I know what I'm doing and I can't ask for help. And then procrastination, which is fueled by anxiety. You know, if I'm not perfect enough, I can't do it well enough. I'm so tired, I don't know if I can do it well. I, I may not do it at all, which leads to lack of sleep, which leads to exhaustion and poor performance. Relying on time-consuming distractions that inspire motivation, you know, distraction to try to inspire motivation, right? On social media, binge watching TV shows, you know, things that, that really are, are not a healthy distraction and surrounding yourself with negative people, <laughs> right? Surrounding yourself with people who are just as crispy and fried as you might be, that might be lending to your burnout. Did anybody chime in on the chat about what you feel like is burning you out the most? How are you contributing to your burnout? A couple of comments, procrastination, um, recognizing that balance is difficult, um, being on Zoom all the time. Yep. Not enough sleep, trying to find balance between multiple responsibilities, it's difficult. Okay. Lots of people chiming in, that's great. So let's talk about this 12 stages we'll go through. I kind of, in the previous slide, I mentioned it, but this compulsion to prove oneself, this excessive ambition, I've got to solve it. I've got to be the super person. I've got to push through. And I'm running up into obstacles with possibly the systems or the organization. And instead of realizing that it's the system and the organization, I will work harder. I'm going to push harder. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to work more hours and I'm going to try harder because it must be about me. The reason why these things are not working is maybe I'm not doing something that I need to do. And you start working endlessly to get it done and pushing as hard as you can. Neglecting your personal needs, right? I, I've met people at work who are like, trying to negotiate and explain why they have to go to the bathroom. 
during a meeting. It was like, well, I haven't gone to the bathroom in six hours. So, you know, is it okay? I'm, I'm in all these excuses for like, literally like the most basic need of eliminating yourself is like having to be explained. Displacement of conflict, you know, arguing with the wrong people, you know, kicking the can when you get home and, you know, arguing with your husband and spouse and, and relatives when really the display, the conflict is, is possibly within the system, you know, at work or someplace else, that displacement of conflict. And that kind of burns out your support system where people are like, gosh, you know, get away from you. You're just too angry and too mean. And, and it isn't even about them. Revision of your value system or self-worth based on your job, right? Like giving up whole parts of yourself because it doesn't fit with this compulsion of excessive ambition. So perhaps you valued hiking and being with friends and family, but now you've given this up because you can't seem to get all of this accomplished. And you don't feel good about yourself doing these things because the work isn't, isn't giving you what you thought it should give you. Denial of problems. Maybe it's because I'm lazy. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I, I wasn't cut out for this. Maybe I need to get another degree or something else is going on. And then withdrawal from social situations. You know, yes, we have Zoom fatigue, absolutely for sure. But sometimes when we're starting to head towards burnout, people will turn on their cameras because they just don't want to be seen. They're not answering phone calls. They're not participating. They're, they're disengaged. They, they have given up on this whole notion that I can make things better. And without social connections and that social camaraderie and engagement, burnout starts to really take over. Behavior changes that are noticed by others. Well, you haven't called me in a week. <laughs> uh, you've turned down 17 invitations to that wine you know, club that we're in. What's going on? Uh, why, why have you, you, you look like you really just like haven't, you know, haven't slept in a week or you're not drinking any water or you're, you're, you're at work all day. Loss of contact with self, meaning you, you've, denied your value system for so long that you're not even sure who you are or who you were when you started and who you might become if you keep going. Take a deep breath, four counts in, four counts out, because if you're relating to this, this is the part where it gets heavy, right? I want you to try to breathe, four counts in, and four counts out throughout this presentation if you're really connecting with this on a deeper level. Stage 10 is empty, emptiness sets in <laughs> where you just feel like nothing matters and uh, you're not connected to anyone or any purpose. And then depression, you're crying for no reason, you're, your sleeping is disrupted, you're not eating well and then total and mental and physical collapse, where it's gone on for so long, so chronically uninterrupted that your brain and your body has said, if you won't stop, believe me, we'll stop for you. And it does. So I want you to listen to this little, I love this little, I love NPR, don't you? <laughs> I love NPR. I mean, I was like, I don't know what I would do without it. I think this is an NPR segment, but it talks a little bit about how this, this um, the stages of burnout, how it was developed. So listen in. If you're the type of person who checks your work email right before bed, and just as you wake up the next day, you might know the word burnout, but you may not know the story behind it. Noel King from NPR's Planet Money podcast tells us about the man who coined the term burnout and then found a sort of solution. In the early 70s, Herbert Freudenberger had a successful psychology practice on New York's Upper East Side. He was a serious, driven man. He'd survived the Holocaust and moved to the U.S. as a kid. Here's his daughter, Lisa Freudenberger. Her dad died in 1999. His childhood kind of stopped at seven or eight because he had then had to grow up pretty quickly and survived in the country. In the States, he was taken in by an aunt who was cruel to him. She made him sleep in an attic. In his teens, he ran away and lived on the street for a while. 
Herbert grew up to become someone who was always pushing himself to help more people. That's why, in addition to his practice on the Upper East Side, he opened a clinic on the Bowery, New York Skid Row. He worked with drug addicts. These young people were really struggling. A lot of his clients, kids, were just cry. You would see them literally holding cigarettes and watch the cigarettes burn out. He'd pull 12 hours on the Upper East Side, then he'd go down to the Bowery and work until 2 a.m. He began to get more and more fatigue, and he began to get stressed, and he was not that pleasant to live with. <laughs> what was that like? Was he a yeller? Yeah. He had, he didn't use his inside voice, shall we say. So so his kids tried to stay out of his way. When Lisa was about five, her mom booked a family vacation to California. On the day they were set to leave, he couldn't move. He couldn't get out of bed. Herbert realized something was wrong, but he was a therapist. So he started self-analysis. He would speak into a tape recorder for an hour or two, and then he'd take a little break, and he'd then analyze himself as if he was his own doctor. I don't know how to have fun. I don't know how to be readily joyful. That was Herbert in an interview he did with the Shoah Foundation. It wasn't just exhaustion. It wasn't exactly depression. It was something new. His mind went to the drug addicts down on the Bowery with their blank looks and their cigarettes burning out. He called his illness burnout. He wrote a book, Burnout, the High Cost of High Achievement. It was a hit. Stressed out social workers and doctors and housewives were like, I have that. Herbert went on Oprah and Phil Donahue, and here he is on All Things Considered in 1981. Burnout really is a response to stress. It's a response to frustration. It's a response to a demand that an individual may make upon themselves in terms of uh, a requirement for perfectionism or drive. But burnout isn't in the DSM, the official listing of mental disorders from the American Psychiatric Association. And to this day, companies struggle with workplace burnout. Is it overwork? Is the problem individuals or the environments they work in? Herbert Freudenberger found a solution of his own. After burnout became part of the cultural conversation, he didn't work any less. But when he wasn't working, he was able to enjoy life. The family even managed to get him to take a vacation at a lake in upstate New York. And Lisa says he seemed happy. He says, come, let me, let me show you how I swim. Let me show you how I swim. He then got into the lake and he proceeded to do a dead man's float. And I'm like waiting to see any flapping of the arms or flapping of the legs or something. Stayed there, got up with the biggest grin and I could see like this inner child and he just flourished and he was so proud. Because did you see me swimming? I'm like, yes, dad, fabulous. The recognition of his work, she says, it made him a different person. Noel King and PR News. Oh, I, I love that story. It's just, it's just he didn't work any less, but he was able to find joy and, and moments and, and probably lived more of a balanced life. And that's what I'm inviting all of you to do. Let's talk a little bit about some of the frustration. We talked about that earlier, not just stress, but frustration that he probably saw. And you might be seeing where you are as well. Chronic and consistently high workload lack of flexibility or control over your work, not receiving your basic resources or accommodations to be able to do your work, low reward, lack of recognition, a mismatch in skills or poor, poorly defined role, a mismatch of values, being asked to do something you don't believe in or doing something really awesome and great that isn't valued. Expectations high with progress being low, or being in a toxic work environment with unhealthy, well, unwell people that really can, can drag you down. And then the neglect in yourself, right? A, a denial. We talked about this a little bit in the beginning, just not even you know, making time to eat breakfast, not working out. More coffee has gotta be the answer and a lot of sugar. Um, staying up later. Um, and um, maybe getting up an hour earlier or two hours later to be able to fit things in. And they have this great show. I, I should have showed a clip on it. I think it was, it wasn't Grey's Anatomy. It was one of those doctor shows where, you know, the, this doctor came in, he was new and, and he was like, I'm going for a workout and, and I have to take a nap right now. I'll do that assignment later. 
and they were like so appalled by his had his willingness to fit in self-care in his work day and I was so shocked to see someone so like so honoring their wellness. And he explained how that makes him a better doctor, a more efficient doctor and more present with his patients by taking really good care of himself and making time and finding time in the workday to do it. And uh, it's, I'll, if I find it, I'll send it at some point. So what we're gonna do right now, let me back this up. I want you to get out a paper and a pen. And we're gonna talk about how you can this is gonna help you to figure out what really, really matters to you, okay? What really matters to you? And that's gonna help you identify where you're gonna spend your energy and where you're gonna spend your time. And it's gonna help you to say absolutely no when it's not a part of your values and yes with enthusiasm when it is. So I want you to um, close your eyes for a minute if you wouldn't mind, participate with me. You're in a safe environment and, or hopefully you're not driving. <laughs> Close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to think about, I want you to think about you're going on this amazing trip. You're going on this amazing trip. You don't even know where you're going, but you've been told you're going on this trip. And you're so excited. You're so excited about it. And you can't wait to get there. And you don't know where you're going, but they say, you know, in order to have the, the time of your life, where you're the most fulfilled on this time away or wherever you're going on this journey, I want you to think about what you, what values that you want to bring with you. Okay. So I want you to look at this list and go ahead and jot down as many values as you can that, that speak to you that says, gosh, no matter where I'm going, and no matter how long I stay there, as long as I have these values, oh my gosh, that makes for a great trip. I'm gonna have a great time. Just write down as many that just speak to your soul of who you are and what matters the most. And if I could have those who have their camera on, maybe a show of hands a little bit that you're, you're making progress and you, you wrote a pretty good list. And if there's none, the, the ones that you care about the most are not out there, write them down. Okay. We're going to go quickly because you got to get going, you know, you got to figure out what's important to you. So now this, the, the instructions, you know, on this wonderful adventure you're going on says, okay, well, you know, we don't have, we don't have room for all of your values. Like you're only going to get two suitcases and you got to pick, you know, your top 15 values. You know, so I want you to look at your list. If you don't have that many, I want you to just pick, pick your top, your top 15 values. If you only have 15, pick your top 10, but I want you to circle on your paper, how to narrow it down. What's really important because you only have two suitcases. And we're gonna go quick. We don't get much time to decide. Okay, now you've got your values. I hope you got your values in your suitcase and now you're going, getting on the plane and you're so excited. You're like, woo, I couldn't check all my values but I've got some great values in my bags and this is gonna be a great trip. Uh-oh, all of a sudden that plane goes down but you're okay, you're safe. You, it's scary and you, your plane goes down and you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I survived. And you get on this little raft and they give you a raft and you're like, oh, thank God I got on this raft. But now I can only take 10 values. 
because that raft is not going to carry all 15 of my values. Which 10 are you gonna pick? Or narrow it down by five if you've already gotten a shorter list. Which ones are you gonna take with you to wherever it is that you're gonna go? There will be problems, there will be awfulness, there'll be some good times, but as long as you have these values, you're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. All right, you've got your values. Now you're, you're trucking along on this raft and you're like, oh my goodness, I've got an island. I can see an island. And so you're like, oh, this is so great. I can't believe it. I'm gonna go to this island. In order to get there and fast enough to where we're gonna be able to you know, survive and be okay, we gotta lighten the load. We gotta make sure we get there. And when you get to that island, you can only be with five values, five of your most important values. These are the things that help you go to sleep at night peacefully. Because as long as you live by these values, as long as you tried your best to honor these values, God, that makes for a great life and a great day. These are also the values that when you are so tired and so crispy fried and you're so scared and you're so down, these are the values that help you get out of bed and say, I'm getting up anyway, because I have purpose and I have meaning and I'm living for these five values. Which ones are they? Which ones define who you are and who you choose to be in life? Which ones help you to make the best decisions about what matters really and what doesn't matter at all. So you're living on this island. You've got your five values now. You're, oh God, you're having a, the time of your life. And you are like, you know, life isn't perfect. It's hard living on this island. Sometimes it's awful. And I wish I could have all of these amazing things, but I don't have them, but you know what? It's still a great existence because I have these values that I honor and I live by. And all of a sudden you got this opportunity, you have this opportunity to get off the island. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to, I get to go back home. I can't believe it. And you chart your course and you get on that homemade raft. And then one by one, the storms come and they grab your values and they're, you know, they're they're really getting after you. And you're like, oh my goodness. I have to survive. And now you're down to your one value. You remember that movie Castaway? This is your Wilson, that volleyball that's your, been your friend, that guiding compass that says, no matter what happens, I will always be with you to shine a light on where you're going, on who you are and who you can become and who you, will never have any regrets in life as long as you honor and have this one really important value. And very quickly, select that one value among your five. Really listen to your heart. Think about who you've always been and who you've been your whole life and, and who you wanna be going forward that makes for the absolute best life possible. And really quickly in the chat, if Megan, you can help me, please list your five and top one values in the chat so that we can compare some. Seeing inner peace, balance, family, friendship, fun, joy, and love, family at the top, Purpose, love, another family, gratitude, personal growth, purpose, compassion, friendship, personal growth, trust, tranquility, God, someone still at the airport packing their suitcase, credibility, <laughs> love, autonomy, exploration, connection, love, truth, creativity, perseverance, loyalty, peace, 
compassion, connection, friendship, learning, trust, goodness, fulfillment, kindness, survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. As many times as I've done this presentation, nobody has ever had the same top five um, ever. And, and rarely, very rarely people have the, the number one. And what does that say? What does that say about who we are, right? Now imagine you've got your, I mean, everybody has different five values. Like every time I've done this, no one, they've had some of them as, as similar, but nobody's had the same exact five and very rarely the, the top one. So imagine working with your peers and colleagues and they all have different values. And imagine the organization that you work for has a set of values and the you know politics and country has a set of values, your religion has a set of values. That can present a lot of conflict, right? And a lot of opportunity for conversations, difficult conversations about what matters to you and what's important to you. A lot of brave conversations about why your no is no and why your yes is yes. And that frustration and that conflict, if you're not skilled at it, can cause some burnout. Because perhaps you're working with people who are looking at your values like they're dirty words, you know? <laughs> and they're like, ooh, that's, mm, I don't think that's something that I think is really important, right? Or perhaps you're working with people who, you know, may be envious of these values because it's not something that's important to them and they feel bad about it. So it's like, well, let's, let's kind of downplay your values because I don't know what to do with that. But it can be a lot of different situations, right? Um, that cause conflict, which can lead to burnout. So I wanna talk a little bit about the, the wheel, the balance wheel, because you're, you're unlikely, obviously, because a lot of you picked so many different things. You're, you're never, ever going to feel, fulfill all of your values in one section of your life, right? Work cannot feel everything that you need in terms of values. And this is where burnout tends to come in, right? If, you're, if your value is social justice or if your value is compassion or whatever it is, and you work in a system that isn't really designed to fully support that value in the way that you thought it would, I mean, God, that can lead to such, such disappointment, right? And such frustration. And it's really important to find other avenues to fill those values to where you're so complete that you have every area of your life honoring those values socially, environmentally, financially, spiritually, that the little things that happen at work and don't get done or, you know, the frustrations, you can live with that, right? One of the things that I really enjoyed the other day is I, I participated in a continuing education workshop with private practice individuals, right? And they were just so happy and like, they took 10 minutes to get the technology working and they were like, whatever, you know, it's like, okay, Bob, let's get this going. And it was like so easy going. And they were just so fun because they, 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 are, they are the captains of their own ships and their own souls in that independent private practice. And so it was just fun to be around that energy. And so I feel like I'm going to participate in more outside groups and consultation and, and, and workshops to give me that sense of uh, you know, what I might be lacking at work. And so I invite you to think about what's lacking in, in your world and, and try to expand your opportunities to gain um, a full and balanced life honoring your values in multiple different ways. Right. This is a little worksheet that I developed <clears throat> concerning work. Uh, I work with students in um, a partnership called the Student Recruitment Retention Center, and they're they're social justice minded, and they just oh my goodness, they're the the captains of burnout. I mean, <laughs> they're working tirelessly in a system where they're the student, um, and they don't have much power, trying to get these incredible things done in terms of recruitment and retention of underrepresented people. So one of the things, the easiest thing to think about is, is, is max, 
try to figure out your sleep. I literally timed it. Um, I, you know, when I was driving into work, I need to go to bed at 9 40 PM. <laughs> I have timed it to a minute and I have an app that helps me to like, okay, it's time to get in bed. Let's get it done because I know, and I've tested it. It's when I have the most positive energy and I'm the most available and the, the most present in my life to be able to honor my values in a really healthy way. So really quickly in the chat, I want you to keep it real and be honest. How many hours do you absolutely need to be your very best self? And how much are you really getting and allowing yourself every night? Everybody's got a number. And if you don't have a number at all, I invite you to test yourself this week to see what it is. So Megan, do we have any? We have a lot. Um, it looks like people are certainly getting less than they need. Um, we're seeing anywhere between seven and nine, um, but it looks like most people are getting closer to six or seven. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're missing a whole hour consistently day to day. One of the things that sleep, that's, that's one of the, the things that they use for torture um, in war is making people go without sleep. It is painful. Uh, and over time, it can start to shut down almost every organ in your body. There's been so many studies on sleep and how important it is. And if you're consistently, you know, missing an hour or two, seven days a week, you better believe it's going to show up in your ability to manage burnout. So some of the things I like to do in this worksheet, and I'll send, I'll send it to Megan, she can send it out, but how much time do I need for sleep? Okay, you subtract that from 24, right? And then you think about your, your non-negotiables, actions I have to take to stay well. Listen, there are things that you, some people just have to do in order to be well. Like, and it could be simple things. Like I have to have lip gloss like, or something. I have to feel comfortable in my skin. Um, I have to, I have to do some level of, of being outside. I've got to have nature. If I don't have nature, I know that something will eventually eat at my soul and spirit. So those are the things that I just will not compromise on. Um, what are your non-negotiables? You have to identify them because this is the first thing that you will try to negotiate and take away and it's the most important thing that will violate your, your, your health. So what are your non-negotiables in the chat? And how much time do you need for that? So these people were like, I haven't worked out. Okay, if you're, if you're trying to say work out to look good and whatnot, that's, you know, it's okay sometimes to let that go. But if you know you need to work out to release your stress, and you, when you don't do it, you, 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 um, you, everything gets worse Then you've got to make time for it. It's just non-negotiable and you'll see people in there and they're kind of annoying right? that really protect these boundaries. I mean, can you come, I can't come in at five o'clock cause I have to go work out, but I can come at six 30. No, I'm sorry. I can't do that because I have to make breakfast at 730 and it has to be a full breakfast. I got to get my oatmeal and that takes 30 minutes in the, in the pot. You know, they're very protective of the things that keep them well and they never negotiate ever. And that's the thing that you have to protect, whether you have to sit down with your boss and sit down with your supervisor or your coworkers and say, Hey, this is my, if you want me to do excellent, outstanding work, you got to give me this. Then you think about the actions I have to take for others, right? They're just non-negotiables. I have to take my son to school. I have to help them with homework. They're going to fell out. These are things I'm just not willing to negotiate based on my values. And then this is the challenging part, right? The intersection of the roles that you play, mother, father, sister, brother, uh, coworker, uh, boss, um, you know, community leader. And what are the values and actions that are absolutely, that, that kind of help me to feel like, hey, I'm not sacrificing everything. They're all working synergistically so that I'm not being robbed and depleted of all of my energy because all of my roles match my values and the actions that I take 
feed my values. So I'm feeling, I'm feeling energized, even though I'm working no less. And then actions I have to take to stay employed, right? There are people that are so fearful of, I mean, you know, in the job market of losing their jobs, they're constantly overworking and taking on so many assignments because they're short staffed or, you know, your manager doesn't know how to do it and, and, and they need somebody to help. Constantly asking for more and more and more and more. And not all of those things are part of your job responsibility. Not all of those things you should do because if you do them, they're going to take away from your actual workload. So kind of identifying what's the, what's the reality here? Let's get some real talk. What do I absolutely have to do to get a good performance review and do well in my job? And how much time do I need for that? So after you filled this out and you subtract it from 24, all the time you need, it's pretty scary. <laughs> I do this with students and they're like, when they do this classroom and their, their, their workflow and they're like, oh my God, I have negative three hours because they're participating in 10 organizations and all kinds of things. They're like, I literally have negative three hours in my day or I haven't even fit in you know, the, the office hours or the studying and I, I haven't even got to that when I put in all of my roles. So here's what you need to do. You need to be able to how to decide. You need to clarify what's being asked of you. Negotiate. I, I can do that assignment, but I'm gonna need to do it after I completed the other 10 assignments you've already assigned me. And I'm gonna need not just have a deadline in a week, I'm gonna need two weeks. And I need more resources to help me out because it's not enough. I can't do it by myself. And, or you need to delegate. I absolutely cannot do it. I have no capacity. Look at my time, look at my energy. I'm gonna to have to give this to somebody else or eliminate it altogether. This is, just makes no sense. It's not valuable. It's not worth my time. The answer is absolutely no, I cannot do it. And that takes courage. But what makes it easier is knowing your values knowing what matters to you the most because it gives you a lot of courage because you already told me in that chat that as long as you live by those values, it's gonna be a good life. So you can say no. All right, let's get on time. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. So evaluating your yes or no. So based on that sheet you had before, your five values and your number one value, as well as your wellness will, like the things that you absolutely need to keep safe and healthy and those non-negotiables. So check your value system. Somebody asks you to do something, are there any conflicts with time, energy, you know, values? Are you aligned with the vision of what it is that they're trying to, to do? Does it align with your priorities and your objectives? Is it aligned to your role and responsibilities? Is this my job? Is this something that, that I'm supposed to do? Is this my non-negotiable that keeps my job happy and good? How much time will this take? And do I have this time? Does this responsibility belong to someone else that isn't doing their job? And perhaps that's where the conversation needs to happen. Check your energy, check your capacity, check your health. How much will I need to expend? And how much time will it take to recover? Yeah, I could take you to the airport in San Francisco from Sacramento at 1130 at night. But by the time I get home after all that traffic, I'm not gonna get home for two o'clock. I'm gonna miss my six to seven hours of sleep. I also have a deadline in the presentation the next morning, which I'm not gonna be ready for. And I've already given you three rides before and you never really pay me gas money. Um, yeah, the answer is probably no. Can you ask someone else? Can I give you the number of the, the shuttle? What kind of support will I need to get this done? And is that su support available to me? Well, I'm looking at this project that you've offered me and thank you for the opportunity and believing in my skill set. but it looks like this is, a, this is kind of work for five people. Are you gonna give me some other people to help me out with this project? And 
do I have enough money? And what does executive leadership think about this project? Are they on board? Do they really support it? If I do all of this work and do it well, do you think that they're going to carry it through? Or is this something that you think they, that you think they need us to do, but you haven't really clarified that it's an absolute must and important to do? So asking a lot of questions. Do the people asking me to do this value what they are asking me to do? <laughs> I've worked in a lot of companies and there's a lot of projects that just disappear because they're like, why did we even why did we decide to do that in the first place? That didn't make any sense. So asking a lot of questions is really helpful. Uh, we'll get to procrastination another time. That's a whole nother, whole nother thing <laughs> as to why this leads to burnout. But basically it's fear of, fear of failure and fear of success. And so then you don't do what you need to do and then you're really behind and then that leads to burnout. So just quickly look at those things. So doing what matters most during burnout. It doesn't have to be the best. I'll do my best and stay in the moment. Perfection is absolutely not the goal. The goal, the outcome is never the goal. When you're living by values-based time management, the outcome is never the goal. The goal is to be in service and in alignment with what you value and what matters the most. And most of us will never see the outcomes of a lot of things that we're working on. But as long as you do your small part, as long as you live in alignment with what you say matters most, it's a good day and let the rest go. I don't have to like it. I don't have to like what I do. And I don't need to wait for motivation to do it. I know that family is my most important value. And I am going to, to make my son a delicious, healthy meal, even though I'm exhausted and I don't feel like it, but I do it because I value him and his health. And that's important to me. And I'm going to eliminate the things that are not as important so that I can make time for that. So coming to the end, we'll answer some questions. I'm sorry, it's hard for me to, oops, ah, sorry. In dealing with those who are undergoing great suffering, if you feel burnout setting in, if you feel demoralized and exhausted, it is best for the sake of everyone to withdraw and restore yourself. The point is to have long-term perspective. If you are feeling this way and it's been going on for a long time, perhaps take a step back and really connect with what matters most. Look at your values and ask yourself, what am I saying yes to that isn't even nearly aligned with what matters most? And what, how can I develop the courage to say no to the things that are depleting me and exhausting me that don't matter to me as much at all? And how do I have those difficult conversations with coworkers and bosses and loved ones and community leaders to let them know that I can't, I won't, do that thing because I don't have time. Lastly, utilizing acceptance can be super helpful. Having mindfulness in each moment and finding that joy, there's joy in everything. I'm having joy right now doing this workshop because I see the smile in Stacy's face. Or Megan's like, yeah, we're, we're almost on time. Three minutes to go. <laughs> uh, collect those joyful moments and savor them. Find your values in the work that you do. I struggle with notes. I hope, you know, nobody's, it's so hard for me to get them done. I, I just, it's like, oh, because I, I'm a perfectionist. And it's like, what if I don't write the right thing? What if it doesn't sound right? But when I, when I let go of that, 
And I look at the value of telling the student's story and summarizing our, our time together. That's when the words just flow. And I love it. So find your values in the work that you do. Recreate a connection to your work. Find your why. Why did you get into this in the first place? What is it that you like about it and love about it? And how can you do more of it and less of the things that, that, that make you upset? Accept each moment as it unfolds because every moment is a perfect moment if you're mindful in, it, in acceptance. Even something that explodes in the workplace can be you know, comical. <laughs> or uh, accepting that, wow, people are really struggling. You can see it. Get into flow, starting from a place of love, right? If there's things that you don't like at work that are frustrating, where is the love? How do I connect to what matters? How do I have compassion in what I'm doing and for others? Comfort yourself through the discomfort, grabbing that glass of water, grabbing your dog and petting it, you know, having a delicious, warm, hot meal. Because not all work is going to be fun work, but if you're doing it because you value it, it'll get done and you'll be able to rest peacefully at night because you did it. And practice self compassion and most of all, grace and understanding and acceptance of, of where you are. And perhaps right now you can practice this with me, hand to your chest, taking a deep breath in, exhaling and saying, I'm doing the very best that I can. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Tracy. I um, know that we are short on time, but we are getting a lot of questions if you would be willing and generous enough to share your slides with us. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, wonderful. So what I will do is um, I will um, make sure that we are putting, um, we are putting the uh, slide deck in addition to any resources on our book project website um, where we will also post the recording. Um, so I am going to, as folks are leaving, just going to give a quick plug for our next events. So I want to, again, thank you, Tracy, so much for your generosity, for your insight and your wisdom and that really powerful presentation. I, you know, I, I was watching the chat. I know that we, um, we talked about how it's difficult to talk and read at the same time, but um, you're getting a lot of love from our participants today. So thank you so much for your presentation. Um, the recording, as I mentioned, will be available on the Book Project website. And there on the website, you'll also be able to find a calendar of upcoming events. Um, and we're going to put into chat links um, for the Book Project website resource page. That is where the um, video recording link will be placed along with a link um, to the presentation materials from tonight. We hope that you'll also be able to join us for our next program next Wednesday, February 10th at noon. Karma Waltonen, who's a continuing lecturer in the University Writing Program, will give a talk titled Losing Our Marbles, Mental Illness Narratives. You can find the registration link in chat and all are welcome at this free event. Again, thank you so much, everyone, Tracy and our participants for joining us today, and we hope to see you at a future event. Thank you, everyone. Take good care.